From the end of the 19th century onward, prominent progressives had been saying that the America of 1787 was irrelevant to the urban, industrial, scientifically advanced nation that America had become. Frank Goodnow, a leading progressive theorist, deplored the reverence that amounted to superstition for the Founders' outdated creation. Under present circumstances, he wrote, the principles of the Constitution, are working harm rather than good. The young Roscoe Pound wrote treatises arguing that mechanical jurisprudence, applying the text of the Constitution to the case at hand, must be jettisoned in favor of a sociological jurisprudence, one that would adapt the Constitution to the realities of modern America. Woodrow Wilson, a passionate progressive from the beginning of the movement, joined this school of thought, thereby becoming the first president who was critical of the Constitution. In a famous speech delivered during the 1912 presidential campaign, later published under the title On Progress, he said to the electorate, The founders were Newtonians and made a mechanical government with its three separate branches and checks and balances. But since then, science had progressed. Blessed with the superior knowledge of Wilson's era, it was now understood that government is not a machine, but a living thing. It falls not under the theory of the universe, but under the theory of organic life. It is accountable to Darwin, not to Newton. It is modified by its environment, necessitated by its tasks, shaped to its functions by the sheer pressure of life. No living thing can have its organs offset against each other as checks and live. On the contrary, its life is dependent upon their quick cooperation, their ready response to the commands of instinct or intelligence, their amicable community of purpose. All that progressives ask or desire is permission to interpret the Constitution according to the Darwinian principle. This view was not limited to presidents and professors. Louis Brandeis was already sitting on the Supreme Court when in 1917 he expressed his contempt for the Founder's vision. Political as well as economic and social science notice these revolutionary changes in America's economy and society, but legal science, the unwritten or judge-made laws, as distinguished from legislation, was largely deaf and blind to them. Courts continued to ignore newly arisen social needs. They applied complacently 18th century conceptions of the liberty of the individual and the sacredness of private property. All Brandeis needed was four other justices who thought the same way. By the time FDR was inaugurated in 1933, Brandeis had been joined on the Supreme Court by two other progressives, Harlan Stone and Benjamin Cardozo, appointed by Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover, respectively. They were known to the press as the Three Musketeers. Arrayed against them were four Madisonian justices, Pierce Butler, James McReynolds, George Sutherland, and Willis Van Deventer, known as the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. The two swing votes were Owen Roberts and Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes. Some erosion in constitutional protections occurred during Roosevelt's first term. Two cases gutted the clause in Article I, Section 10 that forbids the states from passing any law impairing the obligation of contracts, known as the Contracts Clause. But a breach in the Contracts Clause did not touch on the constitutional central restraints. In two cases that did touch on the central restraints on the federal government, the Supreme Court held the line, striking down the legislation that implemented Roosevelt's two most ambitious programs, the National Industrial Recovery Act and the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. The Court also directly confronted the argument that the extraordinary conditions of the Great Depression warranted extraordinary measures. 
in the 1935 opinion that voided NIRA, Chief Justice Hughes, writing for the majority, was eloquent. We are told that the provision of the statute authorizing the adoption of codes must be viewed in the light of the grave national crisis with which Congress was confronted. Undoubtedly, the conditions to which power is addressed are always to be considered when the exercise of power is challenged. Extraordinary conditions may call for extraordinary remedies, but the argument necessarily stops short of an attempt to justify action which lies outside the sphere of constitutional authority. Extraordinary conditions do not create or enlarge constitutional power. The Constitution established a national government with powers deemed to be adequate, as they have proved to be both in war and peace. But these powers of the national government are limited by the constitutional grants. Those who act under these grants are not at liberty to transcend the imposed limits because they believe that more or different power is necessary. Such assertions of extra-constitutional authority were anticipated and precluded by the explicit terms of the Tenth Amendment. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. That paragraph turned out to be the last hurrah for the Supreme Court's traditional understanding of the Constitution. What happened next is still disputed. The best-known narrative is that pressure on the Supreme Court to back down was becoming irresistible by the end of Roosevelt's first term. The unemployment rate was still around 20% when the NIRA and AAA decisions were handed down, and Americans suffering from the Great Depression weren't interested in constitutional limits on what the federal government could do. After his re-election, Roosevelt took advantage of this mood to try to pack the Supreme Court with more favorable justices. That attempt failed, but the message was clear. If the Supreme Court continued to void New Deal legislation, public opposition could jeopardize the legitimacy of the institution. This much is undisputed. In 1937, Charles Evans Hughes and Owen Roberts permanently joined the Three Musketeers. The result was a series of judicial hammer blows that removed the barriers to federal power that the founders had put in place.